Hello everybody, today I wanted to do a book review on the book The Second World War by John Keegan. Oh man, the glare. Sorry about that. Here we go. And this is a book that I was mostly interested in because John Keegan's a fairly famous uh, historian. He's been dead a few years, but he's a British historian. Uh, one that you can find lots of interviews on on television. He's written uh, a lot of books. I think I read one of his other books that was actually about uh, warfare and prehistory and prehistoric times. Uh, and at some point, I think Amazon kind of listed this as a, as a book I might be interested in. And I have to say, after I picked it up, uh, in the very first thing I kind of realized is that I've already done enough reading about World War II that this book is is way way too um, general uh, than what I would typically look for. Uh, almost every single chapter in this book, I've read several book length treatments of the subject matter. And so I thought, uh oh, what, what have I gotten into? I'm going to read 600 pages of a Wikipedia article that I more or less mostly know. Now, I didn't know everything in the book, and there's some interesting points that I do want to bring up. But as I was reading it, uh, I just, I concluded though that this is actually a very good summary of a very complex and broad topic, and that's why I think it's worthy of review here. Um, you know, history has such a breadth and depth uh, that it actually can be really intimidating for people who are interested in it but don't know necessarily where to start. Um, and there's such a hodgepodge of popularized materials out there: a documentary about D-Day here, a documentary about Hitler there. Um, you know, a snippet from an FDR biography or or a Facebook post or an article on Mises or whatever else. And it's very hard to kind of stitch it all together into a cohesive narrative uh, or understanding of what happened. And although this book is very general, it's about 600 pages covering a topic that could be covered, couldn't be covered in a million pages, literally. Uh, I found it to be a, a pretty gripping narrative and a pretty good um um, summary of most of what was happening in World War II. And if you are a neophyte, somebody who hasn't read a lot about it or doesn't know a great deal about it, and you're interested, I think this is a really good place to start. I would stay away from books by Stephen Ambrose and some of the other more uh, popular American authors who tend to really, really focus on things like D-Day and the War in the Pacific. Not that those things don't deserve attention and aren't, aren't important, but there's a tendency to lose a lot of perspective and imagine the war more American-centric than it actually is. Um, and that's not to diminish uh, the significance of the United States and geopolitics leading up to and during World War II or its role in the actual military campaigns. But if we're talking about forces deployed, very much a, a second front um, in terms of you know, the allocation of resources. Um, and so, again, everyone's heard of D-Day. Lots of people haven't necessarily heard of Barbarossa, even though that's an enormously more significant, uh, you know, event. And a book like this, to its credit, covers everything. It covers, well, I don't want to say everything, but it covers a lot. It covers ev things from, you know, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and, you know, the colonial struggles in, in Syria and Algeria and North Africa generally, and also the Japanese invasions of Burma and, and China and the... A Soviet campaign in Manchuria, um, the, of course the island hopping campaigns in the southwest Pacific and central Pacific which are much better known like Saipan, Iwo Jima, Tarawa, New Guinea, Guadalcanal obviously, um, the, the war on the eastern front and the way it kind of divides it is to uh, chronologically uh, cover campaign camp by campaign starting in Europe, starting with the lead up to and uh, the first Blitzkrieg operations in Poland and then uh, in the Low Countries, uh, Norway and then France, and then going to the Pacific Theater and kind of doing the same thing. And I think so each each theater is getting like maybe two or three chronological parts of the book that treat it. And then there'll be little side treatises basically uh, uh, dealing with specific overarching kind of thing. So when the Battle of the Atlantic gets brought up in, in basically 1940, in the context of the war between Germany and, and the UK, 
he will go and basically describe the Battle of the Atlantic through the course of the entire war. So even though you're only maybe a quarter of the way through the book, you are talking about the end of the war in terms of the U-boats in a couple chapters to deal with that. Um, likewise, at the end of the book, when he talks about the uh, firebombing of uh, Japanese cities and then uh, culminating in the uh, use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he devotes a, a chapter to explaining the development of the, of, nuclear, of the nuclear programs, both in the United States and in other countries like the UK and, and uh, Germany. And so then the chapter kind of rewinds and goes back to the beginning of the war to talk about how that started. But again, it's very, very brief. You know, the Manhattan Project is given like a chapter. Uh, the the battle, uh, battle of the Atlantic, a, a battle that spanned basically the entire length of the war, uh, is covered in a chapter. And... And Barbarossa is covered in a chapter, and just for some like context, this book here, Barbarossa derailed, right? Here. You can see that. Look at look at how thick this is. This has got to be, and these are thin pages. Yeah, this is over 600 pages, and not only is this only about Barbarossa, it's only about Barbarossa from July 10th to September 10th. So it doesn't even include the first month or first couple weeks anyway, and the end. I think this is part of a three-volume set just on that one operation. And so this book is as big as that entire book, and it's covering only this one topic. Or we've got this here, Darkest Hour. And this is about the – sorry about the lighting. Uh, this is about the uh, famous Japanese base at Rabaul in New Britain. Uh, and, you know, that that's the first book in a trilogy. I haven't read that one, but I read the second and third um, parts of it. I didn't realize it was a trilogy when I read the second part. That's why I read them out of order. But, um, you know, that's a trilogy about a single, albeit important, base in the Pacific War. And Rabaul is only mentioned by name twice in this entire book. So that gives you some idea, which is not to say that this book is worthless or that that's something that I would expect. There's so much to cover that, you know, he could double, triple, quintuple, times a hundred, times a thousand the length of this book and not be comprehensive. And so you can't, I'm not faulting it for that. I'm just saying uh, it gives you some idea of, uh, when I say it's an overview, it's an overview. But it's a good one. If you don't know that much about World War II, if it's all kind of a jumble in your mind, what happened where, when, who, this will allow you to kind of put it into order and understand it in a way that you don't already. Uh, now, if you also want to learn more about it, uh, you know, any topic that you look up here and you thought, oh, that's interesting, I'd like to know more, you can go and start digging into those various different fields. You know, I, when I read this, I wasn't, there were a few things that I didn't know a lot about. You know, I had stuff about the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. I knew that happened. I knew Haile Selassie was the emperor. I didn't know too many details about why that happened and, and the history behind it. But again, it's very, he, he goes very quickly through it. Um, there are a couple other takeaways that I thought were pretty interesting. At one point, he talks about Lend Lease, the program of the federal government basically um, subsidizing other allied governments, and actually before they were even technically allies. And even though Lend Lease isn't exactly a secret, and I think most people who have heard about it are aware that it was fairly significant, uh, he puts the degree of how much was subsidized into perspective. Um, staggering perceptive perspective um during the war primarily to the ussr and to the uk uh the united states supplied enough supplies that they are the equivalent of 2000 infantry divisions enough enough supplies enough resources you know guns clothing boots weaponry whatever ships uh that the the if we were to translate that into infantry divisions it comes out to 2000 infantry divisions and to put that into context, the German army at its maximum uh, deployment in World War II deployed about 300 uh, infantry divisions. So almost seven times the, the maximum German military. Now, of course, the German military wasn't all infantry divisions. They had divisions that were uh, armor and, and whatnot that are, are obviously much more resource uh, de um, uh, dependent than, than an infantry division. But just to give you some idea, like just what the United States gave to its allies was that that gargantuan a sum. I actually have uh, Sutton, uh, Anthony C. Sutton has a book, uh, his Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development. The second volume is exclusively about 
lend lease as far as the USSR is concerned. Uh, I don't know if the USSR or Great Britain received more. They both received a lot. He also says that the UK about a quarter, 25% of their war material in the Second World War uh, came from the United States directly or indirectly, uh, which is pretty pretty staggering. Um, now, the idea that the United States is you know, an economic powerhouse that was able to supply the Allies is not an insight unique to him or unique to anyone who isn't even the least bit familiar with the war, but it's still staggering to see uh, how how enormous that was. And that says nothing about what the United States was doing to supply its own soldiers, which I'm assuming was greater than Lend Lease, but he didn't actually do a direct comparison, so I can't say. Um, there was also uh, some interesting talk about the motivations of the various leaders. Uh, and he has a section where he says, you know, of, of the main leaders, Churchill, Hitler, Stalin, FDR, uh, all of them at FDR have very clear goals. They had very clear ideas and maybe they used subterfuge and and uh, espionage and whatnot to achieve those, but they had very clear ideas of what they wanted and we can look and understand their motivations very well. He goes, with the exception of FDR. He's like, FDR, FDR is, is mysterious. Uh, it, he always seems to be talking out of two sides of his mouth, not just talking, but acting out of two sides of his mouth. Uh, at certain times, it sounds like in the lead up to the war that he wants to keep America out of the war, and other times it sounds like he wants to get America involved in the war. And to the great frustration of people like Winston Churchill. Uh, and he does not uh, put forth any kind of explanation of what's going on there. I think, based on other reading that I've done, is that uh, FDR became well we have to remember that FDR became president a long time before World War II began uh, he became president after the depression had begun and you know I think he was just a rich East Coast dandy who uh, wanted to be perceived as a great president and in 1932 that has nothing to do with war he didn't care about war there was no war on the horizon uh, he thought that the way to become a great president would be to wage a war against the depression and, of course, his waging of the war against the Depression very likely prolonged it, if not made it much worse. And there's a whole a whole lot of literature on that that's become more and more mainstream as time has gone on. It is not simply uh, the purview of Austrians or anarcho-capitalists who question the validity of his um, proposed solutions to the New Deal, but or not solutions to the New Deal, but uh, the, to the Great Depression. Uh, but it's interesting to see, as soon as the war in Europe starts, FDR, I think, realized that war presidents are more famous, more well-known, and more acclaimed than presidents during peacetime, always. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a certain cynical unfairness to this, because in many cases, these are wars that are not the fault of the president, that they don't really cause... And they don't take any active role in fighting, and so they can sit back in the White House, or in his case, uh, convalescing in his various resorts as he tries to live out the rest of his days after suffering from polio. Um, they're going to get all the credit, and indeed he he did. You know, you look at it's it's fascinating how that works. A similar comparison could be made to Lincoln, although Lincoln did, for his part, try and meddle in his with, with what his generals were doing quite a bit, and FDR did not. Um, I think FDR was a wise enough guy to understand that he would be uh, basically uh, canonized in the civic culture of the United States by virtue of the fact of him being president during the time of the war, even though he did probably nothing uh, to help the war be won. In fact, I think he did several things that maybe made the war much worse. Um, and he talks about that here. Uh, I'd always known that the Allies had uh, basically, at, after the Casablanca conference in 1942, um, said that they would only accept terms of unconditional surrender from Germany and Japan. Uh, and I always thought that that was stupid, because then the Germans were able to go to their people and be like, yes, Hitler's bad, yes, uh, the war is bad, but unconditional surrender means that we will be completely prostrate, uh, prostrate, excuse me, to the, uh, to the Allies and they'll be able to do whatever they want to us. Uh, especially, uh, it wouldn't be so bad if it was the Americans or the English, but uh, being prostrate before the Bolshevik hordes of the Russians is not a fate that anyone wants to suffer through. 
uh, and German propaganda very explicitly played on this. We need to keep fighting because if we, the only the only way to avoid disaster is victory because they are basically said they won't accept anything but total domination of us. Um, and the Japanese did the same way. If you had any kind of political, if they had said oh, the terms of, of surrender would be that Hitler needs to go, then almost everyone in the Wehrmacht uh, or a large number of people in the Wehrmacht and the civil uh, administration would have a good, compelling reason to try and oust, sister and oust Hitler and end the war. And with that ultimatum there uh, for unconditional surrender, there was much less plausibility in any of that happening. And the same thing happened in Japan. Um, and apparently the entire idea of unconditional surrender was originated by Roosevelt. Uh, and I think that's just a, uh, a callous act of bravado that he would never have to back up. He was not going to be storming the beaches of Normandy. He would not be fighting. He would not be risking his life. He would not be invading these various uh, little atolls and volcanic uh, rock islands in the Pacific, dying, um, you know, by the hundreds or thousands, in order to force these combat these these powers to come to unconditional surrender. Even though both of them were aware that they were in an almost unwinnable, and I stress almost completely unwinnable situation, especially after 1942-1943. I think I think the odds that they were going to win the war were very, very small, even from the outset. Um, you know, you never want to say it's impossible. Hypothetically, lots of things could have happened, uh, but the chances of, uh, of an Axis victory, and if we break it down, a, a German victory over the UK and then of the UK and Russia, or of, of, of the Japanese over the United States, uh, very, very, very small, uh, probably less than 1%, and declining steadily as the war progressed. Uh, they weren't stupid, they were aware of that, and if they had known that they could have come to some kind of terms, in the case of the Japanese, if they had been aware that they could have retained their emperor, something that they ended up being allowed to do anyway uh, they probably would have come to terms much faster and saved millions of lives, literally, or at least thousands. Um, and why this hasn't generated more outrage on the part of more people, I, I don't understand. There seems to be a lot of debate about the use of atomic weapons, which is actually, that is an important debate, but it's kind of related to the debate of just wiping out civilians, which the Allies were doing anyway prior to that, and you know, ethically speaking, what's the difference between firebombing Tokyo and killing 110,000 people and nuking Hiroshima and killing 78,000 people? I mean, the one, the firebombing with conventional incendiaries has probably actually killed more people than the atomic weapon did. Um, both of those events, though, were probably only necessary because Japan was unwilling to lose its emperor. And if we had just said, well, you can keep him, you just have to give up all the territory and surrender your armies, the war might have ended in 1944, 1943 even. Um, and, you know, how that decision is so uncritically um, accepted is just kind of, well, it had to be unconditional. You know, having, you know, it's not weak to say we'll take conditions. If they offer bad conditions, you just don't have to take it. If Germany says, well, we want to keep Hitler in power, you can just say, well, we're going to keep fighting until something else, you know, you change your mind on that. Um, so that was interesting. I didn't realize that uh, Roosevelt was the initiator of that. Also, he says uh, that somehow, and he talks about espionage, uh, and it's fascinating how both sides had espionage coups against each other. The Germans somehow learned in 1944 how Germany was going to be partitioned after the Allies took over. They learned what parts of Germany would be administered by the Russians and what parts of Germany would be administered by the Anglo powers in France. And I don't, he didn't explain how they learned, but they, they knew. And basically everybody in Germany was aware how that was going to be cut. And when it became clear that the war was going to end and that the, uh, Germany would lose, there was a spontaneous mass migration of literally millions of people from the areas that would be controlled by the Russians to areas that would be controlled by the allies. In fact, some of the, and I didn't read this in this book, but I read it in others that, uh, some of the German armies, you know, persisted in fighting in the East but not in the West, or not nearly as hard in the West, with the purpose of hoping that the Allies would occupy as much of the country uh, instead of Russia as possible. Um, and for anyone who's aware of what happened in the areas, I mean, 
the Allies committed war crimes. There are many bad things happened. Uh, British and American soldier, sh soldiers uh, did do many bad things, uh, horrible things. But if there, there's absolutely no comparison to what happened to people who found themselves uh, being occupied by the Red Army. And he talks about even in this book, you know, German, I mean, the, the mass rapes are obvious uh, and well known. People, most people seem to think that the, the Soviet capture of Berlin uh, involved the largest mass rape in history. Um, but he even talks about, you know, women being basically crucified on wagon wheels and then raped to death by, you know, you know, streams of uh, Russian soldiers. And you can kind of understand why a large area of ethnic German settlement in Eastern Europe and what used to be called East Prussia, but is today like Northern Poland, you can understand why that place is no longer ethnically German because so many of them voluntarily left and then after the war were forcibly removed. Uh, so uh, that was pretty interesting too. I wasn't aware that the Germans knew exactly. I'm, I think it would have been understandable for them to assume there would have been some kind of partition. Um, that they knew exactly where it was was news to me and I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so here's, so again, I, I do recommend this book for anyone who's interested in World War II and doesn't really know where to start. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really cover everything, and that's one of the flaws I think I see with overviews like this. Um, there's a tendency, because it comes across as comprehensive, there's a tendency to read it and think, okay, I know it all now. And really, that's, that's an impulse that you should try and resist. Um, I, in fact, I just read just a few weeks ago, someone on Reddit to you know establish their credentials said, I've read a thousand pages about World War II, as if that was... I mean, that's not bad. That's good. I mean, that's more than a lot of people have read, sure. But to think that you then understand the war, it, it, it's highly suspect to, to make that claim. Uh, and, you know, this book being only 600 pages, it's a start if you don't know anything. And it's it's kind of a nice overview for those who maybe know a little bit more or will give you some insights into other areas to study. But it's important when you... And this isn't just this book. I mean this is anything to realize as much as you've learned there's a lot more that you don't know uh, the, as your as the perimeter of your knowledge increases the you know as the or how do I say this like the if your knowledge is like a, a an island as the island grows in area as your knowledge becomes larger the perimeter of your ignorance also becomes larger and the more you know the more you realize you don't know uh, and sometimes with a book like this, it gives the appearance of a complete narrative that encompasses everything. And y you do see this a lot. Not, not I've never seen someone do it with this particular book, but uh, you know, I've I've heard people, for instance, who read Howard Howard Zinn's book, who will be like, "I know it all because I read Howard Zinn's book." Howard Zinn's book, uh, or "I know it all because I've read uh, you know which, which, his books, The People's History of the United States." You know, that kind of mentality is something that you should try and avoid. Even though there are good things to learn in most books, or even all books, even if books are wrong, you can still learn from their mistakes. And this is definitely a good book with a lot of good information in it. The fact that it purports to be comprehensive could give someone the illusion of knowing, of thinking that they know it all. And he doesn't explicitly come out and say, look, there's a ton here that I can't be. It's sort of implied because there are parts where he references debates and disputes that are taking place for instance he talks about a little bit about pearl harbor and did did the u.s know the japanese were going to do it and he he comes down on the side that they didn't but he acknowledges that there's a great deal of disagreement about that on who knew what when and what types of codes the magic which was the uh, american code breaking um naval code breaking apparatus what were they able to understand and when we obviously know later in the war they could read uh, and not later, even early in the war, they could read uh, Japanese naval codes. There's debate if they could read them before Pearl Harbor, and even if they could, if that would have been enough, a sufficient warning. But he kind of only tilts his hat that there's a debate. He doesn't really go into it that much, as of course he can't necessarily. Um, so there's little bits of that where you get a, a sense that like there's a lot more to the story that he either doesn't want to go into or he just can't doesn't have space. And you know, until you start getting into those individual aspects on your own, you know, your understanding is 
you know, limited. Of course, your understanding is always limited. So I don't, I'm not saying that as like, a, as a dig or as, a, as a, you know, um, uh, in a pejorative way, but just understand because you've read one book or a couple books or even hundreds of books, it doesn't mean you know everything. It doesn't mean that you understand it perfectly. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you couldn't stand to learn more. I tend to go over these things in waves. So I'll do, you know, World War II, a couple books on World War II, and then I'll come back to it. And in the meantime, do books on the Civil War or something else. Uh, and I remember there, in the Civil War, there's a good, I won't do a review of it, but uh, Shelby Foote has a great three volume history of, of the Civil War. And if you have, don't know anything about the Civil War and you read that book, you're going to know a hell of a lot more than you did before. And that book being three volumes is a lot more comprehensive about this. And also, since this is about a war, even though there's, you know, a vast amount of information on the Civil War, I'm sure that the record, the, the recorded information about the Civil War is probably, in, not infinitesimal, but minuscule in comparison to the recorded information about the Second World War. Um, you know, that book is a good place to start. But you still have to understand it's only like the most basic outline and also it's someone else's version of that you know keely is probably a good historian he has his detractors and i'm not saying he's the be all and end all but you can almost tell that he has he almost, even though he's british he has an, a, an american bias um if you've seen interviews with him he talks about world war ii he was a child i think he was eight or nine when it ended and he talks about really being quite taken by American servicemen and finding them really, really compelling. Um, and at one point in the book, he actually says during the uh, part uh, on the invasion of Normandy, uh, he says that the 101st Airborne Division is uh, the cream of the American army, which is correct probably because that was the intention. But then he says it's probably as good as any two of the other best divisions in the entire world. You know, as good as the two best Waffen FS di divisions or whatever and i was like I, I i feel like that's hagiography like that's something that stephen ambrose would write that that's um real cheerleadery kind of uh bravado and granted he's from the uk and not the us but that doesn't necessarily make it objective um and that's just a little example and that's not to taint the entire work um but that's that's just something you have to assume like objectivity is like something you strive for but you can never achieve there's always bias, and it's very it's very refreshing when you have an author who admits that. Um, it's actually kind of dangerous when you have an author who will per make it seem like or purport to be objective and not be biased, when of course they have to be. Even if they're not intentionally biased, they're limited by their own perspective. They're biased by their own experiences and what they've read and what they've seen, uh, even if it's not like a intentionally deceitful attempt to uh you know skew reality their their limitations as a person are going to be present present in the narrative and you have to understand that when you read it that there's there's some skewing there you know uh, uh, joe davis the ironically named uh, anti anti-southern uh, historian says history is not what happened history is what people say about what people write about what happened and uh, i think unfortunately that's correct so anyway it's a good book um one day, I'll, maybe I'll do a whole recommendation of a whole bunch of other like World War II books or Civil War books uh, or World War One books for that matter, where I won't review them all, but kind of give a list of the ones that I think are good. Um, but yeah, I think that it's definitely worth reading if you are interested in the topic and don't know a lot up front, or even if you do and you'd like to kind of go over everything in breadth and maybe fill in some of the holes that you might have. And the sun is illuminating me. So anyway, it's getting kind of bright here, and I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.